I, I can't say it. Two reasons. The first, very easy. In short, the second, a longer story. First, I am a Catholic because of you. Your being here, your witness. I'm privileged to be an old friend of many of you. We've made the journey on this winding road together. I begin, therefore, by thanking each one of you for coming here this weekend, sustaining me and each one of us in the continuance of this journey. I want to thank Father Tom Blackton for his introduction, a privilege to be introduced by you, Tom. Janet Potter and John Huchon, special, grateful word to you and to your entire committee of planners. Why am I a Catholic? The longer story. Shall I begin at the beginning? Who would have thought that a priest preaching on the Boston Common 60 years ago could set in motion a momentous change that has kept me and perhaps many of you in the church all this time and that still defines the great argument that Catholicism and other religions are having with themselves who would have thought that we would so well remember that priest, whose name, as you know, was Father Leonard Feeney? And the topic of his sermons, as you know, was no salvation outside the church. You recall that, of course, as the long-held dogma dating at least to the 1302 papal bull, Unam Sanctam, only those in full communion with the Pope in Rome are assured of God's grace. Everyone else will burn in the eternal lake of fire. Father Feeney's diatribes were aimed especially at Jews. Unluckily for him, one of the people who worked in the nearby Back Bay of Boston and who could regularly hear his preaching during lunchtime strolls was a fellow named Dick Pearlstein, who with his brother ran a stylish men's clothing store named for, his, for their father, its founder, Louis. The store is still in Boston and still stylish. Unluckily for Feeney, Dick Pearlstein's wife, Dolly, was the sister of the Catholic Archdiocese of Boston, Richard Cushing. Dolly was an MTA token taker, a no-nonsense Irish Colleen from Southie. Years later, Dick's nephew Steve Pearlstein told me that their marriage, Dolly's and Dick's, though condemned by the church, had been quietly blessed by Dolly's brother. How the Archbishop must have winced to hear of the anti-Semitic slurs that were the staple of Feeney's preaching. That Cushing took in what those slurs meant to his sister's husband, 
is suggested by the fact that he ordered Feeney to stop preaching. And no matter how consistent the preaching was with the doctrine of the church, he ordered him again to stop it. The priest refused and refused again. Cushing excommunicated Feeney. Just what Feeney was hoping for. A confident Father Feeney appealed at once to Rome. To the astonishment of the whole Catholic world, the Vatican upheld the excommunication. Feeney was out. It was 1953. I was 10 years old, living in Alexandria, Virginia. The nuns of St. Mary's School were abuzz, and the Monsignor was flustered. I went to my mother. Mom, a priest was excommunicated for preaching no salvation outside the church. She said, I heard. But mom, I thought that's what we believed. My mother answered calmly, it was. <laughs> what do we believe now? We believe, she said serenely, Live and let live. My mother, like countless other American Catholics, had clearly been prepared for this shift by the experience of intimacy with her own versions of the Pearlsteins. Our next door neighbors were named Seligman. My dad's secretary was Miss Ginsburg. One of my informal faithful favorite uncles was Gil Levy. Oh, doomed? Not to us. In the new world, unlike the old, rubbing elbows with those who believe differently was the norm. When one religious absolute bumps up against another, each one becomes less absolute. As the Vatican's ruling suggests, this peculiarly American phenomenon had begun, especially in the post-war period, to have its effect everywhere. The Feeney story points to the larger question that defines the seismic shift that not Catholicism, along with contemporary religion itself, from the blocks of long-held dogmatism. We are gathered here in Detroit as part of what has been, for many of us, a lifelong reckoning with this new religious condition. Not just the Roman Catholic Church, but all forms of belief have been upended in our time. Philosophical paradigms overthrown, the coming above all of feminism, the end of colonialism, the arrival of native peoples, who had no need to arrive. Revolution after revolution, the new condition of our ordinary lives. A revolution in spiritual consciousness has occurred across the planet. Something comparable to the mutations in human awareness that occurred in the eras of Jeremiah and Sophocles 
and Confucius and Buddha and Lord Krishna. In any such context, the great question becomes, how do humans negotiate the tension between continuity and change? Not a Catholic problem, a human problem. How do humans negotiate the tension between central authority and the prophetic edge, between firmness of identity and innovative spontaneity? And when these tensions become conflict, you have a crisis. And surely, it is a crisis that has gathered us here this weekend. So the first thing to be said about this crisis is that it is far larger than Catholicism. And the second, of course, is that such change is difficult and contentious. Who among us here has a heart that remains unbroken? Who? And is it so different from those who disagree with us? No. Those who disagree with us are distressed and troubled too. The whole body of Christ is broken. Were it otherwise, the change confronting us, whether we seek it or not, would not be significant. That this change is so significant is what makes this crisis painful. But the third and the most important thing to say about what gathers us, we are here out of love for Jesus Christ and for the tradition and the community that makes Jesus Christ available to us. We are here out of love for the Catholic Church. And I am proud to be here with you. I repeat, I am a Catholic because of you.